computer. Okay. Yeah, I think it's recording. I think. Okay, you're great. Okay. Oh yeah, it's recording. It's recording. Awesome. To stop recording. So All right. There's no light. There's no light. It just. You're, says, if it says if it says it's recording, you're recording. So we're we're on. So Sema, take it away. Okay. Well, good morning or good afternoon wherever you are, everybody. I'm Sima Lieberman, and I hi Lewis, and I am so excited to be here today. My original thought, I thought we would get, I was hoping well, we'll start out with maybe like 10 people and we've got like almost a hundred people and there were people who are on the waiting list. So I'm, I'm so excited to be here with everybody. And just to give you a little bit of history, this is something I've been wanting to do for a long time to create a webinar and have just a comfortable conversation about race. Some of you who know me know that I, I speak on this a lot. I've been doing diversity and inclusion now for about 25 years, and I've spoken and written about race, and um, I've been doing dialogue for a long time. And, this, and, I, so, and I said to Carol, I said, Carol, let's do a webinar together, well, just a comfortable conversation on race, because everybody always talks about how difficult it is. But I'll talk about race with anybody because I've reached a level where I'm very comfortable talking about it, and I know it, and I know it can be awkward. So that's why I thought we just have Carol and I would just have a conversation, and um, if you have any questions, please feel free to just use the, the chat room and we'll get to your questions. Um, so Carol, why don't I turn it back over to you, just a little bit about you. Great. <clears throat> Thank you so much. I am Carol Copeland Thomas, and I am delighted to be Sima's friend, longtime friend. We met through the National Speakers Association, a great organization where I've had the privilege of working with many speakers, especially in the diversity space. And so Sima and I go back um, quite a long ways, and we have mutual friends as well including the late Roosevelt Thomas and, and so many others who have just been uh, giants in this particular industry. I work with large and small organizations around the issues of diversity, multicultural issues and inclusion and empowerment and leadership and have been in the space for 30 years. So it's hard to believe that uh, 30 years have come and they continue to go. And I was talking with someone the other day and I said, you know, even though I've been in this space for 30 years, a, you have to learn how to do things differently because I can't teach and train and coach the way I did in 1995 or 1987 when I started. You have to take a contemporary look at everything. And B, it just means that there, the connections and the collaborations that you have as a speaker and a, and a trainer are global now. So diversity is not a domestic issue. I believe we have people who are here from other countries. And why don't you, in the chat room, tell us where you're from. <clears throat> I'm in the Boston area. Sima is in the Berkeley area. So let us know who you are and where you're from. We would love to get a sense of, of that and just put everyone to everyone and then you can type right in the chat room. But we're gonna have a great conversation. I'm looking forward to it, and I thank you so much, Sema, for inviting me to do this. And you can see, wow, we have people from Illinois, North Carolina, Oregon, San Francisco, California, uh, Mumbai in India, love India. Love uh, India, love Mumbai. <laughs> absolutely. So yeah, keep those uh, locations coming. So again, thank you very much. And this is going to be a very rich conversation. Sima? Yeah, I, 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 I thought we could start out <clears throat> with just talking about how we got involved in this work <clears throat> and how we got involved in talking about race, like when was it, when, when our early memories, our medium memories, our late memories of, of talking about race. And I just want to let everybody know, this is going to be very, this, our style and our format is very casual. Mm -hmm. So it's not, we're not, we don't have like a formal outline, but this is how we would continue having that conversation. Right, right, now, right. For me, I think my first experience with somebody who was different or from a different race was when I was, when I was eight, I had a friend um, in the third grade and her name was Edith. And we became good friends. We'd go to each other's houses. And I went to, I remember going to her Halloween party one year. And one day I was walking down the street. I grew up in the Bronx 
And I was, and you probably tell by my accent that I'm not from <laughs> California. So I grew up, those of you who know New York accents, I grew up in the Bronx and I was walking down the street one day and, and I was eight years old. And I was walking past, I don't know if any you know, remember or know of Woolworths, which is kind of like yes. called the five and 10. Mm-hmm. And I was walking down the street and these people were walking up and down the block, a whole group with signs and they were chanting. And I'll never forget this. One, two, three, four, don't go in here anymore. Mm-hmm. Two, four, six, eight, Southern Woolworths segregate. Mm-hmm. And I was with my friend Nikki and her mother and I said, what's going on? And it just so happened that her mother had been a freedom rider um, for, for, for voting rights in the South. And she said, well, they're marching because in the South, black people can't eat at the same lunch counter as white people. Mm. And I remember saying, that means that Edith and I couldn't eat at the same lunch counter. That's not fair. Let's march. So that's when I, I, started, I started marching. And that was probably one of my, my first awareness of race and differences or how people, how people looked at race. Mm-hmm. And then a couple of years later, I, was, um, I went on the March on Washington in, um, was it 1963? And I always tell right. people, I wish I could tell you that it was because I heard Martin Luther King's I Have a Dream speech that it changed my life. But the reality is, I was pretty young. So I don't even think I would have really quite probably understood his speech. But what was so amazing to me that day was to see people from, of all these different colors, all these different races, religions, ages, people I had never seen before. It was my first time. I remember, I remember seeing a lot of people with leather sandals. I don't know Jesus. why I remember that. And, uh, and now you're back. Great. Yeah. And... But just seeing all those people and remembering the feeling that I got, we went into Washington and seeing all these people on either side of us, like we were in a caravan and just waving and just waving and welcoming us. It was that feeling of being welcomed, welcomed by people from so many different cultures of all these different colors that made me feel at home. Mm -hmm. And that's when I, that's when I started. That's when I really got more involved in the civil rights movement. Now, that doesn't mean that I was really comfortable talking about race. Because just because I'm involved doesn't mean that I know what to say. Mm -hmm. So I'm gonna talk more about that in a little bit, but Carol, let's just tell us a little bit about your history. I'm from Detroit, Michigan, originally, and uh, from a very proud black family from the South. My parents, their family members were all in the South, either in Georgia or uh, South Carolina, migrating north. So the concept of race was just embedded in my family. It was not something that I learned. It was something who, it was who I was. But when I think about the black experience and and being an African-American, one thing sticks out in my mind. I was very active in the Girl Scouts and became a brownie and and went up the ranks. And then when I was about nine years old, I believe nine or 10 years old, I went to Girl Scout camp, Camp Metamore. And I was so excited. It was a two-week camp. It was going to be my first time away at camp. And uh, just a a really exciting experience. So we were there, and when we checked in, your parents bring you there with all your gear and you check in. And I'll never forget that I turned the corner and a a child who was probably not much younger than I looked up at me and said, Ooh, mommy, there's, I'm going to use this word, I hate this word, but I will use it. There's a nigger. And I sort of did did a, a head flip just to figure out who was she talking about. There was a word I wasn't that familiar with. I knew it was not a great word, but certainly didn't expect to have that word used on me. And so that was um, an early example of the affirmation of the, the race conversation and the N-word and the impact that it had on me. The other example probably had to do with neighborhoods and the importance of neighborhoods. My mother's people were all from Columbus, Georgia, 
and other parts of Georgia, they were educated. I'm very, very lucky and, and fortunate that I am the third generation to graduate from college. So my mother's people were educated teachers and working in the church, own businesses, etc. And so now my, my daughters are the fourth generation to graduate from college. So my uncle's after school, my uncle after school, uh, when he was finished with school, he was the principal of Carver High School in Columbus, Georgia, typically would come up and visit us. And I remember just the conversation and the talk that would go on and just how different things were between uh, activities in the North and in Detroit in that area and activities and the segregation that they were plowing through in the South. So it was not something that we talked about openly in our family. It was just something that you knew and you knew that the civil rights movement was very much in place. But so that's a North a, and South bit of dynamics. There were dynamics going on right in Michigan and in Detroit. I lived principally in a black neighborhood. It was uh, a neighborhood, a middle class neighborhood with homeowners. <clears throat> Excuse me. There were apartment buildings and schools, etc. cetera. Um, but also uh, there was the sense of knowing where not to go. You may go there to work, but you didn't necessarily have an opportunity to live there. And a neighborhood like that was called Dearborn, Michigan. That was a suburban community outside of Detroit the home of the Ford Motor Company. Henry Ford had his plants there. So we knew many people who would go to work in the plants. That was very common. But you knew with Mayor Hubbard and the people who lived in Dearborn during the 50s, you didn't dare think of living in Dearborn. And there were even opportunities where in certain neighborhoods like that, you wouldn't be there after hours or whatever because of what may or may not happen to you. So segregation was something that was part of who we were and it impacted us directly. So it was not something that you read about so much. It was just the, the kind of living that you had. But segregation also provided more opportunities for entrepreneurship and economic development to really benefit your neighborhood. <clears throat> so my doctor was black. Stores we went to, many of them were owned by blacks. Beauty shops, obviously barber shops were black, church black. And so you had the sense of pride because of the neighborhood and who populated the neighborhood and who lived there. So it was the kind of experience where you saw things that were taking place in other parts of the country, but then you had the, the kind of issues that you dealt with in areas like uh, Dearborn, Michigan. I, I say that now because you flip the script now, 2017, and Dearborn now has one of the largest Arab American populations in the country and Arab American populations outside of the Middle East. And, you have blacks and many other ethnic groups who are living and that are living in the Dearborn area. So time changes things. And you can compare that when I went away to college to Emory University in Atlanta, went south. And my freshman year, uh, first couple of weeks, we had a picnic with the other black students. And the picnic was held in Stone Mountain, Georgia. Stone Mountain? And Stone Mountain, Georgia. Oh, wow. And oh, uh, Simon knows where I'm going with this. But Stone Mountain back in the 70s was very active for Klan activities. So it was a great place to picnic, but you knew at dusk you were gone if you were a person of color. So we had a great time. I'll never forget that. But we packed up and we went back to our dorm rooms at a certain time because it was just not safe to be there. Now, Stone Mountain has had a black a mayor. I know my friends who live in Stone Mountain. So again, time changes things. But when you mention those names, you get that kind of reaction, Dearborn, Stone Mountain, because you know the dynamics of race and how they played out years ago. Yeah. You know, and it's interesting you you talking about um, being middle class because yeah. now with the media, there's so much stereotyping. Mm -hmm. People are talking about poor blacks, poor mm -hmm. blacks. Mm -hmm. And so people started thinking. So other people think, oh, all black people might, must be poor. Like when Donald Trump gave his speech, what was it? He said, oh, you have no money. You have no You said job. that in Detroit. Yeah. What? Yeah. Because... 
And he, he said he said that in Detroit, and my brother, who's an attorney in Detroit, took great offense yeah. at his comments. And my on my radio show, I interviewed my brother, and we talked about all of the dynamics and the nuances with Detroit that have everything to do with just a great population of people, and they're not all poor black people. So we were very offended by his comments. Yeah, so, and when I was growing up, I, um, I grew up in the Bronx and our family was not middle class. They wanted to be middle class. But, you know, I, we hadn't reached that level. And, but I had one of my best friends who, who was black, lived in a private house. Mm -hmm. And I remember they had wall to wall carpeting, mm -hmm. And most of the black people I knew growing up were, their families were very, um, well, two families, but, you know, despite the stereotype, mm -hmm. and very arty. They were very involved in the arts. So well, as I was growing up, that was my, because you know, you know how like we see things through lens, the lens that we see things through is just from our own experience. Sure. And since I didn't really have any understanding, I thought, oh, then everybody else must be like this. Hmm. And so when people only see things through the media without having any type of experience, that's what, that's what, they, start, that's what they start thinking. Oh, sure. well, if you're black, you must be, um, well, I had this actually, a, a friend of mine whose husband is a, a, she's a professor and her husband's a, um, a rocket, a rocket scientist. He's a physicist. Literally. <laughs> yeah, literally. And one day she was at work talking about her kids and a woman who was not black came up to her and said, wow, it must really be hard being a single parent. Hmm. 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 Wow. Said, no, hmm. I'm not a single parent. Hmm. Hmm. But, you know, I, I look at conversations on race and why it's so important and why so many people are interested why do you think that some people have a hard time talking about race? What do you think the challenge is for some people? Our history of this country, I, you and I have been doing this work a long time, me 30 years, and we have yet in 2017 to have a decent nationwide open and on, honest conversation about the history of this country. The history is very rich, it's diverse, but we have a lot of challenges that are baked in the cake one of them deals with, with, uh, with slavery and its existence. It existed a long time. And when you look at my roots and you look at my family members and the fact that fortunately, uh, two of our ancestors were allowed to marry back in the 1700s and stay on the plantation. They were not separated, thank goodness. And they had 14 children and I'm a product of, of that descendancy, but that's not always the case with many other black families where they were separated, just the whole dynamics of slavery and the impact. And, and many people say, well, that was way back then. And, and, you know, why are we talking about that now? I'm a true believer that those who, who fail to learn the list lessons of history that was said by George Santiago are, are doomed to repeat them. So it's not, it's not living in the past. But it's, it's a sense of acknowledging the past and acknowledging where we have come from, acknowledging the fact that this whole conversation, some about race, in many ways comes from, from uh, Thomas Jefferson, who was one of the orchestrators of the, of the concept of one drop, where if you had one drop of black blood, then that constituted you as a black person in this country. Or if you were uh, a slave and if one parent was free and the other parent was not, if the mother was a slave, then you remained in bondage. And so just the legislative concepts and the things that it, that it definitely had and the impact it had on people like me, my people, and my people be, before me, uh, acknowledging that and, and having an understanding of its negativities, its, its benefits for some, and the implications for so many others, that kind of conversation, I think, is, is important. We've come cl close. We've had parts of that conversation. But I, I think we're, we're certainly now with this present administration a long way off from having a serious conversation about race. So it, it's understanding race, but not just from an American perspective. I, or, I, we have or a or black and white perspective. Not just black and 
white. Absolutely. We have a friend here from Mumbai. I, I've been to India now for four times. I have very good friends in India. I'll be back in February. I go back and forth. India has a, a, a color issue. They have an issue in terms of light skin and dark skin. They won't necessarily talk about it here in the United States, but going over there, I know the dynamics of not only the caste system, but the color system, the, the racial composition of someone's pigment. It's not just India. It's in parts of Asia. It's definitely in Africa where I've also been. So this whole concept of race and skin color is fascinating and one that we need to explore a lot more in depth to understand its origins, but how we can get to the point where we can have these kind of conversations going forward where it can make sense and we can uh, move beyond that, uh, that, that concept. Yeah. You know, and oh, somebody, and then Arisha just said, yup, um, the obsession with fairness, did you see, I couldn't see the whole thing, mm -hmm. but. Across the Indian uh, subcontinent, yeah. continent, yeah. I mean, yeah. they deal with, there's a, the, the, the skin bleaching industry, huge there, oh, fair and lovely. Yeah. I saw, I don't know how many fair and lovely um, ads uh, on billboards. So, and again, I love India. <laughs> and I, normally I have an Indian outfit on, I don't today, but I love India. But those dynamics obviously are in play. Oh yeah, abs absolutely. In fact, I was on a website yesterday called Soul Tree because when I was in India, I bought some great products and um, it was uh, frequently asked questions. And somebody said, it's a skin care. They said, how come you don't have any skin bleaching cream? Mm -hmm. And they said, we don't believe in it. Mm -hmm. and, then they, and I thought it was really well done the way that they said it to make the point to people, no, you, know, you don't need to bleach your skin. Why do you want to bleach your skin? And another thing, I think one of the reasons too that I wanted to have this conversation is because I've been doing one-on-one -on -one video interviews with people on race, people from all different cultures, all different backgrounds. And when I ask people what stops them from having the conversation, because so many people say they want to have a conversation, people, are, people, say, people say, because I want to have the conversation, but I don't know how. It's, mm -hmm. One woman, one young, one young woman said, I'd like to have the conversation, but I don't know how because it's really awkward. She's a young Asian woman and she's People aware of- to know, keep, keep, I, I start talking when you freeze, so you go on, Sima. Okay, keep, I want, I want, okay, so everybody, she's not interrupting me, but sometimes I freeze. So if I freeze, then Carol's just gonna keep on talking. Right. So she said, I don't really know many, any black people. She's against racism of all kinds, but she doesn't really know any black people. And so she feels really awkward. And I've talked to other people, uh, I've talked to white people who said, well, that they didn't want to say the wrong thing mm -hmm. because they didn't want to offend anybody. Right, right. And they didn't want to make, and they didn't want to make people mad. Mm -hmm. And then I've talked to people of color who, I, who tell me they only talk about it within their own group. And they don't want to hurt anybody's feelings or make mm -hmm. anybody else feel bad. Mm -hmm. So people are worried about hurting each other's feelings. But at the same time, like, especially if we look at it in the workplace, why it's so important, because I think it's important to talk about the workplace, that if we don't have these kinds of conversations, then there's tension, then there's unspoken tension. Mm -hmm. And when there's unspoken tension, then work doesn't get done. People can't collaborate. Mm -hmm. So what do you, I mean, what's been your experience, Carol? People, uh, most Americans are good people. I'm, I'm going to use this from a domestic U.S. perspective. Most Americans are good people. They work hard. They want the best for their families, and they want to treat people right. That's that's the premise. Uh, if you're in Minnesota, they call it Minnesota nice, <laughs> and and that's 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 who we are. <laughs> and we're a litigious community, also. So people get sued quite a bit in the United States. And again, as I go back. I have to go back to the days of slavery. That legacy that we have has been such a layering, it has such a layering effect on our, on our society that it is equated with white guilt, that I, I'm, I'm gonna be sucked into this conversation. I, I don't want to um, um, take ownership of what did or didn't happen, whatever my family did or didn't happen. And so it is easier for me to not say anything 
or to be polite, and then in my own tribe, at home, at the dinner table, et cetera, then I can have the, the in-depth conversations that we'd like for you to have. You know, Melody Hobson, I, I'd encourage everyone, and I'll put the, the information down in the chat room, Melody Hobson has produced a brilliant TED Talk. And the, the premise of her TED, TED Talk deals with being color brave, not being color blind, but being color brave. And I think in our society, in our country, there's a real need and a necessity for us to be color brave, to realize, yeah, we have stuff in the past that we aren't very proud of. But in order for me to really understand what is going on in the mindsets of people who are different than I am, I've got to ask the question. A-S-K is the ultimate word, the three-letter word, not a four-letter word, but a three-letter word that will help us to begin to open the doors. Number two is that you have to understand that there are times when these conversations are hard. Yeah. They are hard, yeah. they are messy, and they are making you uncomfortable. But that is what you need in order to move to a level of greater understanding. It, it's very similar to sort of, um, you know, putting things together and, 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 and doing things that, are disruptive and maybe challenging and painful, but then ultimately you come up with a much stronger way of understanding each other. And that's, I think, where we want to begin, begin so that people will respect you. They may not always agree with you, but at least you're color brave enough or courageous enough to bring up these conversations. I love, I love the terminology, color brave. I'm going to yeah. start using it. You know, I remember when I was younger, being with friends uh, who were black and but there was like this we still didn't have that conversation mm -hmm, mm -hmm. we still kind of pretended mm -hmm. you know i probably had that conversation in my head they were having their conversation in their head and i remember one time somebody said we we're talking about somebody one of my african american friends said something about well you know because you're white and, and I she said, whispered it and she, I said, <laughs> I know I'm white. Yeah. <laughs> or when people say, don't, don't use the word black in front mm -hmm. of them. Mm -hmm. People know what they are. Mm -hmm. You know, you're not telling any, it's, it's not hurting people's feelings. It's like when people think that it's hurting people's feelings mm -hmm. to acknowledge who they are. And what happens, you know, what, what I found in the work that I do is that oftentimes in organizations, People say, well, I don't want to talk about differences. I don't want to focus on differences. They'll separate us. But instead, people walk on eggshells, mm -hmm. and, they, and they're separate. They don't talk to each other because particularly mm -hmm. a lot of the white people don't want to say the wrong thing. Mm -hmm. And as a result, they don't say anything. And then the people of color feel like, man, I'm being ignored. Mm -hmm. I'm going to ask Lane if you would put yourself on mute. That would be great, Lane. Just uh, put yourself on mute. I'm there. You are okay. Sema, continue. You're good. Or let's. Say, <laughs> <laughs> All right. So, yeah. So so people will feel people will feel like they're completely invisible, mm -hmm. and people don't say even say hello to them. And I remember talking to uh, one of my clients who was white, and she said, "Well." I don't really know how to engage and I don't want to say the wrong thing. I said, so but what you end up doing is then you end up ignoring this person because you're afraid to say the wrong thing. So you're saying the wrong thing. Mm -hmm. You're saying something that's offensive or somebody maybe has a, has a name that's hard to pronounce or that people are not used to in the United States. Mm -hmm. And so then somebody doesn't call them by their name because they don't want to hurt their feelings by not saying your name right. Mm -hmm. But it hurts people's feelings more when you pretend that they're not there. Mm -hmm. And I think we have to get past pretending. And I know it's awkward. I mean, sometimes, sometimes it's, it's awkward. Like I'm talking to somebody I don't know. We're talking about race. It could be awkward. Sure. And I know that if I don't have that conversation, it's going to be even more awkward. And that's yeah. the workplace. We end up having silos. 
Yeah. And it'll 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 be it'll be a missed opportunity too. I mean that that's the most important thing is that when you don't have these conversations, especially when timing is optimal, then you you miss out on the essence of learning and you miss out on the essence of clearing up some misunderstandings that may be in the place in place that you don't even uh, realize. That you know the conversation in the chat room is really really great. So keep the questions coming and we'll we'll do our best to answer them. We we got a question from someone talking about well slavery just didn't happen 250 300 years ago it's happening today in in, in russia and other parts I, i'm very very well of uh, the sudanese situation because yeah. my church was actively involved in sudan when they were at war and the the slavery issue was was huge so you are absolutely correct there are modern day countries that are actively involved in slavery issues and the the skin care color also has a lot to do with it let me also read some Something that uh, was also mentioned by one of our uh, uh, listeners here, watchers here, years ago, when the World of Women of Color event, uh, Diversity Best Practices' first action was to answer a polling question. I was surprised that so many women in the audience, so many whites in the audience, were shocked to learn that they weren't trusted by others. It was a kick in the pants, to, so to speak but it facilitated the discussions for the rest of the day. Agree, it's hard and messy. Establishing some level of trust is part of being able to have those essential, messy, hard talks. So again, it can be a real shocker at first. What? Me? Ah, uh, ah. Uh. And then you can begin from there. Sema? Yeah, and I'm sure, you know, and I'm sure that I was one of those people because I remember thinking that, oh, I'm a good person, I'm against racism, big racism, mm -hmm. oh, I'm against uh, discrimination, big discrimination, but there are things that I didn't understand. Yeah. And so when people were calling me out on things, I remember feeling like so uncomfortable. One, I wanted to just like kind of, oh, like just crawl away. Mm -hmm. so, Oh man, damn, why did I even say anything? Why did I even say anything? I should have kept my mouth shut. You know, or not me and getting really defensive and coming up with an excuse instead of saying, you know, maybe I need to just shut up and listen. And that was okay because the other thing that I see sometimes, and oftentimes, let me say, and I say this, and, and when it comes to race, I see it with white people, but not to pick on white people. If I see it with LGBT, I see it with straight people, I see it with people who are like non in the group, whatever it is, that there's a feeling that the only way to have the conversation is to be guilty mm. Mm. and to walk like 10 steps behind. Mm. You know, there was a group we always used to make fun of, um, it was a, a white group who would go, yeah, there they go, walking 10 steps behind the black people because they're not worthy, they're not equal. And, uh-oh, now I'm freezing. Keep, go, you're, go, keep going, keep, I filled in the blank for you. Uh, I think that that's really important to not feel, to not get into this guilt thing because when you're in a guilt thing, it's really a part of being self-obsessed. Mm -hmm. And you can't really be there and support and be equal and friends and peers because ultimately, if we want to do something about race or even in the workplace, people have to be able to relate as peers mm -hmm. and if you're walking around feeling guilty or or i mean and i know that oftentimes like it's shocking when people you know people of color have been through mm -hmm. and sometimes somebody will work with somebody for 15 years ago oh i didn't know that but i think that's the issue the issue is if you talk to somebody mm -hmm. on a regular basis mm -hmm. you know it right Right. And, and so you brought up another point is that here you talk about people who have worked together for years and years and years, and they know the representation of that person. They don't really know that much about that person. So it's not true that even though you work together, um, you'll be able to find out as much as you can about that particular individual. That's not always the case. Another thing, Sim and I, Sim and I probably know this too, is that just because you're young, just because you're younger, 
that yeah. automatically makes you an enlightened person. That is absolutely not true. We, we look at the craziness that's going on in the world, all these terrorist acts, the things that are happening here in the United States, the, the poor activity that took place in Portland, uh, Oregon, just like, what, two weeks ago? I mean, those were young people. Those were not people in their 60s and that's 70s. Right. That's right. Those were young people committing those heinous crimes. So, there, you don't have an inoculation just because you're a young person. If you grow up in an environment that is teaching hate, preaching hate, then clearly you can be tainted by it. So that that's important. Someone else asked in the room, and the questions, keep those questions uh, coming uh, our way. Somebody asked, what do you ask first? What, where do you start the conversation? I would say a comfortable way would say something like this. I am an XYZ person. I'm an, I'll use myself as an example. As an African American, I think a certain way just based on my background and, and what I've seen and experienced in life. Can you give me a sense of your upbringing and, and how were you raised? What did, what did you talk about around your dinner table? That could be question A. Or you can say, I grew up in Philadelphia, or I grew up in, in Portland, Oregon, and I remember XYZ experience. Did you have anything that happened like that to you when you were growing up in Dallas, Texas? So you can use a person's stories, your stories, to, to frame the beginning of the conversation and then pull that person into the conversation so that they can respond with their particular stories. I guarantee you, if you start off there, it'll be honest, it'll be transparent, it'll show that you don't know everything, I don't know everything, and, and, and then you can begin the conversation there. And I just want to say that um, Crystal Vanderboom said something I think is very insightful. Guilt prevents you from having empathy and being curious about others. Mm -hmm. And I think that that's really true. And I like what you said about having the conversation. And for me, it's also about finding a way to connect with people. Right. Finding, there's always a way to connect. And one of my clients brought me in because they were, a, they were almost an all-white sales group and their clients a lot of their clients are from the middle east and from africa these were, they were selling to doctors and they wanted to bring in more sales people who also were from similar backgrounds to be used as resources mm -hmm. and the white sales people were worried because they said well, what are we going to have in common what are we going to talk to these people about <laughs> and so we created you know in, at, by the end of the day of working together they had a lot to talk about and I think that there's two things. One is it's important to be able to make connection and find similarities. Mm -hmm. And then to use that, you build trust, you create connection to then talk about differences. Mm -hmm. then, because then you've got a bond and then you can talk about differences. And what happens, I think, a mistake that some people make is they only stay in similarity. And, and they don't and then you can and, move on. Mm -hmm. Yeah, they don't move on. Or they immediately go up to somebody that they don't know and they go, oh, hey, how do black people feel? How do Chinese people feel? They go, I don't know. You know, you can't, you can't just do that. And also to remember that. Uh, Sima, can you repeat what you've just said because you froze twice? That people will go, that on the one hand, people will go up to somebody they don't even know and say, well, I think I need to talk to somebody about different. So I'm just going to go and ask somebody. Oh, you're Chinese. What do Chinese people think about this? Or you're Japanese. What do Japanese people think about this? And they you, you know what that's like when you do that, Sima? Wow. When somebody makes that kind of bold, direct move, first of all, we Americans are sometimes too direct. That's like going up to somebody and saying, hey, I really like the way you move. Let's go out together. I want to date you. It's, it's like somebody would slap well, you. People might do that. <laughs> but that, that, that's, not a, that's not cool. <laughs> That's not cool. <laughs> but I, I, you know, and, and, and we ha I have the conversations now. Get to know people now. Like one, one thing I always tell people is I say, start looking to see who you say hello to. Oftentimes people don't realize it, but they only say hello to people at work, people who look like them. And they don't, they don't say hello. They don't say, I say, say hello. And then say, how are you? And shut up and wait for the person to answer. Right. <laughs> no, because I was talking, I, I have a friend who's, uh, who's Thai, 
And she said she couldn't understand. She said, you know, when I talk to Americans, they say, how are you? And when I start to answer, she said, they've left. She said, I feel like She's running really after them. on a roll. Hey, wait, I have problems. Save me, save me, save me. I have problems. <sighs> but other, other people say that too. And, and I know that another reason Daddy's conversations now is because when serious things happen, people need to be able to talk. For instance, mm -hmm. I heard this from several different people that after the Trayvon Martin verdict, mm -hmm. a lot of white people said that they were really uncomfortable going to work with black people because they felt that the black people were looking at them funny. Hmm. They felt that the black people were really angry, but they didn't really know. They didn't have a conversation. Maybe that person had a bad day. Maybe, you know, maybe the... Their partner left them or their dog died. I mean, you don't know. You don't really mm -hmm. know mm -hmm. by looking at somebody how you think that they feel about you. Mm -hmm. And then and then I, I and then a couple of black people said to me, um, like one person in particular said, I work with mostly white people and they're all really good people, but after the Trayvon Martin verdict, nobody said anything to me. And I felt mm -hmm. really alone. I had nobody to talk to about it. I felt really alone. Mm -hmm. But if you have those relationships before, right. talk about it. Or I, and I had somebody who I had somebody who was uh, Thai say to me, she said, you know, I don't know where I belong mm -hmm. because people don't really talk to me either. Mm -hmm. Because. She said, I want people to just come up and say, and just start approaching me and start talking to me. But again, it's being so afraid of saying the wrong thing. People do this with disability, disabled people all the time too. You know, they pretend they don't see them because they don't want to say the wrong thing. And you know what? We are going to say the wrong thing. Sure. We it's are messy. Going to say the wrong thing. <laughs> yeah. We're going to be embarrassed. Right. And it's going to be okay. Yeah, it's, it's a messy process. And again, what diversity teaches you is that the process, it's a moving target, first of all. And you're not going to get things right all the time. I've been in this business 30 years. I'm still learning, learning about myself, learning about other cultures. But if you decide to be brave and to be courageous and to be principled, then you will know again how to first use yourself as an example, use this whole concept of asking, talking about your own stories and how they can relate to other people. It can be a marvelous way to really move forward. I love what you're saying, Sam, in terms of having these conversations before things happen so that you have a basis and a framework. But I know companies, I know organizations are extremely risk averse. And so they, uh, they avoid it like uh, the plague. I'm going to give an example in a minute of a very color brave uh, organization that I'm working with here on the East Coast. But I want to respond to a question that was asked earlier. I, I love when people mix it up. There was a question yeah. about, you think it's wrong if a white guy plays funk? No, I love it. A uh, black woman uh, sings Puccini? Absolutely not. I was a music major in college. I majored in voice, so I know about that. Can a Polish-American cook curry? Yes. Can someone in Mumbai, which used to be called Bombay, cook uh, uh, gotapi? And I may be mispronouncing that word. Absolutely. I wear mostly Indian outfits. I wear salwar sets all the time. Yes. All I love them. <laughs> Just and I get compliments on them, and it brings up a way for me to have a conversation about what takes place here in the U.S. and elsewhere. So we live in a country and in a society where it is perfectly okay to experiment, to adopt the cultures of other, uh, uh, of other countries and other traditions and do it in a very respectful way. I think there's nothing wrong with that at all. I think that's a great way to really uh, to, to operate. Sima? Yeah, and I was going to say it, it's really all about having – respect right to the culture right you know, i mean people talk about you know like all these white kids listen to rap i gotta tell you i do listen to rap myself and i probably know more about rap than a lot of other people that i know <laughs> i'm obsessed with music i'm obsessed with all kinds of music i'm really like i'm obsessed people who mm -hmm. don't know that i am um but the problem is that when somebody appropriate somebody's culture it's they're doing it in a disrespectful way or they don't really care 
where it's coming from. Or they don't understand. They don't have the cultural sensitivity or the awareness level to understand why something should or should not be done. Yeah, and, and, and again, it's, it's how you do it. You know, I remember one of my friends said, hey, everybody wants to be black today, but did they want to be black during slavery? Hmm. There you go. <laughs> you know, you and go. so understand, too, that when you're in a culture, to understand the whole story. And you know what? Mm -hmm. It really, if you start understanding the whole story, it really, um, it really, it really enriches you. Yeah, yeah. And you grow, and I find, I think with our societies, and again, I'm, I'm an American, so I'll speak from my perspective. Americans have to move beyond their comfort zone. Americans, first of all, less than, I thought it was 30%. I've gotten some new numbers. It's still definitely under 50% of Americans have passports. So we, by and large, don't travel. Yeah. And, and if we do travel, we go to safe places where we're used to traveling, and that may be on the beach somewhere. And that's the extent of your vacation. So <clears throat> unless you develop a framework of learning, lifelong learning, traveling is the best way to, to, tra to, to, to be a lifelong learner. If you don't have that kind of level of awareness, it is very easy for you to shell yourself in, to protect yourself, to be around only your own people, to drive from your office or your yeah. home to your office, to your favorite store and the grocery store or the liquor store and you come back home. And you can never get out of that, that mindset and never really grow. Now, we have the internet. Right now, we have you know, 50, 60 people online from all over the United States and elsewhere, India, et cetera. And we can learn from each other. This platform, the, the internet, <clears throat> virtual uh, conversations like this can provide the best opportunity for people to learn with out ever leaving your particular space but you've got to push yourself and do it you know there's some people who well, i don't know how to use the computer well then learn <laughs> learn you can be 85 years old and learn and you can learn about other cultures in other areas so again you have to be want you have to want to step out of that comfort zone and learn the best way you possibly can either physically traveling or learning technologically so that you can broaden your horizon and be of use to someone else who is very connected to you. Yeah, and I want, I want to get to, I want to get to, I want to get to a couple of the questions too, but before mm -hmm. I do that, I want to say that sometimes no matter who you are, whether you're a straight person trying to talk to an LGBTQ person, a white person talk to a black person, a Latino person talking to, to an Asian person, whatever it is, someone, somehow, at some point, you're going to say something and you're going to, talk to somebody who's not that enlightened and mm -hmm. they may start putting you down, but you know what? That's just one person. And, and right. I want to say to everybody, whatever group you're in, I like to say, educate, don't annihilate when someone makes a mistake. Mm -hmm. Don't just go off like, oh, oh my God, I can't believe that you don't know that. Like, you know what? I don't know about you, but I can grow up in my dinner table. We didn't sit around and talk about these things. Now my son, it's a different story because mm -hmm. You know, I mean, but in my family, we didn't, you know, th these are all these things, all these things have to be learned. Right. Everything, everything, everything has to be learned. It, so don't feel, I mean, you can feel bad if you want. I'm mean, like, I tell people that you can feel bad if you want, you can choose to feel bad. But the reality is that we have to teach each other and we have to learn. And there's going to be people that are not, you know, there's, they're not at that level of knowing mm -hmm. how to educate, but we need to be able to do that. Mm -hmm. And so, Carol, here's a question. Um, what was the question? I'm trying to have to scroll We have back. some great questions coming in, too. It was, what is the appropriate balance between acknowledging differences and trying your best to treat everyone the same? <sighs> trying to treat everyone the same is difficult. Because, because <laughs> there are 7.3 billion people in the world, and we're all different. So I don't know if you can treat everybody the same versus treat, treating, some, treating everyone equally or having the level of equality in your framework so that you can treat people 
on an equal basis. That's a little bit easier to do than trying to treat everyone the same. Now, I have a couple of kids. I have grandchildren. I don't treat them all the same. I treat them all equally based on my children, based on my grandchildren. So I think that may be an easier way to look at it. But always remember, as I just said, 7.3 roughly, there are 7.1 billion people on the planet. Everybody is different. Everybody is different and everybody has choice. They have choices to make. And so I think if you have that kind of concept, knowing that the choices and the differences are the DNA of each person, but the commonalities that we share can somehow bring us together. So you can acknowledge it and you can recognize someone because of their nuances or their difference. I have two daughters and they're as different as night and day, even though they have the same parents and they grew up in the same household. So, you know, you, know, you have that, but, you know, there's this whole concept of understanding that I need to provide the kind of respect to them as their mother, and now they're adults, so that I can have them on an equal playing field versus treating them the same. Simone? And, and, I, and I think that and people always ask that question, because Carol and I both, Carol, you and I both facilitate, we're facilitators, and we often facilitate like for employee resource groups, and we bring yeah. people together. Mm -hmm. And I been called into different organizations when there's been tension, mm -hmm. when people have either been in silos or people have assumptions about each other that are like really wrong based on, oh, she doesn't like me because I'm white or they're racist. And in fact, what's happening is that people don't know how to talk to each other. So sometimes you have to bring in a facilitator Mm -hmm. because people will either because one of the organizations I, I, I was working with and actually it was the thing where people <coughs> were acknowledging the differences you had people from you had somebody from a, a Latino culture who was Latino who was <coughs> the boss of a white person and the mm -hmm. white person thought that the Latino person didn't like him because he was white mm. and the Latino person thought that the white person was being racist. Hmm. And they thought, we have nothing in common. So I did this process where I had people actually tell their stories. I, can't, I, I had a way of phrasing the question. And it turned out that the Latino man and the white man were mirror images of each other. Wow. Both had grown up, same economic class, huh. both grown up single parents, huh. both had kids when they were really young. I mean, they had so much in common and it was amazing. Mm. And as a result of that conversation, afterwards, they got together, they were blown away, they got together and mm. they started collaborating and solving some problems because there was an issue that had to be solved in terms of the, the hiring process that they were using. And right. they came up together with a way of solving the process. Uh-huh. Huh. My goodness. That's amazing. That, that, well, again, they had the conversation. That's the key piece. That is the important piece. We, we've gotten a, a request to do another session on color and class. Okay. So I've, I've agreed for us. We're going to do it. <laughs> that okay, Sema? Yes, yeah, it's important. We'll, we'll, Sema, we'll, we'll send the information out. And because Again, that's something that we don't discuss that much, and we can go more in depth about skin color, class. Right. And it, this is definitely a global conversation. So I want my friends from India on that conversation, <laughs> definitely, because that is so critical when you look at some societies uh, in, in addition to the United States. We have about six minutes left, so please um, put your questions there. I will put this information in here again. And I am giving away a free report so to help you to navigate which, with what term is it, African-American or black. So you can click on the URL and put your email address in there, and we will send that. You'll get that report immediately. I think you'll find it very useful. And it will also, you can use that report as a conversation piece. Maybe you can take it back to your companies and your organizations so that 
you can discuss this and use this kind of format uh, and the fact that you've been on this webinar to learn these important issues. So again, you can do that. I'm also going to put our contact information <clears throat> in the chat room so that you will have that. And Sima and, and I are also uh, offering you an opportunity to uh, have us independently or uh, collectively on for a um, 20 minute free consultation. You can take the information that is in the chat room. It's there. <clears throat> Contact us. We'd love to have a conversation with you uh, in our various uh, areas of expertise. And I guess one closing question, Sima, um, we haven't talked that much about East Coast concepts and yeah. West Coast concepts. Give us, give us a sense of, of how this frames itself out from a West Coast perspective, Sima. Okay. Oh, that's that's. Oh, but before we do that, I just want to say too that we have a list of tools that you could use because of the time we didn't get. To, I wanted to review all the tools, and we didn't get to review all the tools. So we have a list of tools that I would love to give it to you. East Coast, West Coast. Let me just say this. Now, this is a stereotype. This is a generalization. Okay. Um, I am from New York. I'm still, in some ways, I'm still. I'm. Still, I don't know why my. Oh. In some ways, I'm still very New York, but New York people tend to be, tend to be on the East Coast more mm -hmm. direct. They will be more in your face. Okay. On the West Coast is the California way of doing things where it's people are very nice. Uh -huh. They're all really nice. Uh -huh. and I think that that's a difference in perspective. And again, that's a generalization, but it's, it's how people are taught to survive. Now, I have found that wherever you are that in california people will say like i grew up around people from all different cultures and i don't have any issue well as soon as you start thinking of it as an issue right issue. but you could grow up and be in a place that's very diverse but it doesn't mean that you talk to people it doesn't mean that you <coughs> interact with them mm -hmm. that way. Or, un or understand it too yeah understand yeah. it yeah and, you know and, and i and I would say that's a little bit of a difference. And one thing I had to learn when I came to move to the West Coast was to slow down. Hmm. I'm Jewish. I'm from a working class background in the Bronx, and we were, were loud. Yeah. Very loud. <laughs> and we talked very fast, and we used an overlapping communication style. It <laughs> means that, and most American people are dominant cultures. You talk, then I talk, then you talk, then I talk. Mm -hmm. that I was raised, and some other cultures too, like, um, African American, a lot of people from African American cultures are like this too. Another culture, we use an overlapping style, which means you talk, then, oh man, I could really relate to that. So I got right. to interrupt you to tell you my story. Right. You hijack, the, you hijack the conversation. Just yeah. like what we do. Uh, but, if, and, and, and if but if there's a pause in the conversation, then I think you're not listening to me. Mm. And in some cultures, like in some Asian cultures, Native American cultures, I talk pause. Pause is in, where the listening and the respect is shown. But the way I was raised is, you got to interrupt me, right? <laughs> what I had to learn when I moved to the West Coast, and also just in general, just because I grew up a certain way doesn't mean that's the best way to relate to everybody. So mm -hmm. I had to learn how to do I talk, then you talk, then mm -hmm. you talk, then you talk. So and what do you think, Carol? That's Eastern West. <clears throat> I'm from the Midwest originally. So we do have this level of decorum and niceness that I grew up with. <clears throat> you speak to people. That especially if you're in the black community, you learn how to speak to people. You you nod to people on the street, especially if they're black and they're going they're coming in this direction and you're going in that direction. There's this whole cultural dynamic where you definitely nod to acknowledge their existence. So we have that. I notice here on the East Coast there is a formality in place. There is a a a, a, a sort of a, a, a stiffness. Oh, in yeah. place that can can happen but again you got to cut through that through that and realize especially here in the in the greater boston area um you have so many ethnic groups you have africans who are here in this area you've got caribbean black people who are here you have african americans you have people from brazil you have people just from all walks of life sort of mixing in this framework but there is a a, a quicker pace than you can see in the South or in the Midwest. And so that, that hurried uh, forward motion 
sort of blends itself in and adds into to how we communicate with each other. But I, I think that um, once you get into a group where you feel comfortable, then the guard comes down and then you really find out how people really feel. And it's not much different than other parts of the, of the country. Yeah. yeah. And I just say too that once you get to know people, you become part of a group. Mm -hmm. People think mm -hmm. everybody wants to relate to people who are like them. But when you get to know people, you can look totally different from different countries, but then you find out that's a person like me, but you won't know it until you talk to people. Right. So it's 10 o'clock. We will do this again. Yes. So many people have said, hey, will you do it again? <laughs> I said, what? yeah. Like I said earlier, I was hoping to get at least 10 people, and now look, at we've got almost 100 people. So <laughs> Thank you all, and please contact us afterwards. We'd love to hear from you. Absolutely. Um, it's, it's been a ball. I've enjoyed it, and it looks like probably our next subject will we'll kick around the, uh, the whole discussion about skin color and class. That's going to be electricity on steroids. <laughs> and if you want to know how to have the conversation, want some more information, contact us. We will send you our list of tools. Absolutely. And we're right. also available. Right. Thank you all so much. Take care. Have a great afternoon, morning, and it's been a great conversation. Sima, you and I will reconnect. Thank you. Bye, guys. <laughs>